Kevin, appreciate the worship today. And if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17 as we look today at David and Goliath. One of the things we're uh, doing during the month of October and the first Sunday of November is this emphasis on our teenagers and our young people. And um, I want us to look at what a teenager did for the kingdom of God today. 1 Samuel chapter 17, I'll begin reading in verse 45. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I'll give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel, so that all of the earth may know. David had a sense that this story is going to get some publicity. In fact, I googled David and Goliath, and it brought up 31 million articles on David and Goliath. How much can be said? Well, evidently, a lot. And remember, this is 3,000 years later. And David told Goliath, he said, I'm going to do this so that the whole earth will know there's a God in Israel. Well, and let's continue reading. Verse 47, And that all this assembly may know the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it, struck the Philistine on his forehead, and it sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. I hope you've heard of David and Goliath in, a, in our generation, in our culture, uh, Bible stories aren't as well known as they were when I was growing up. But if you have heard of it, it's good sometimes to just revisit these old stories and remember the lessons that they teach us. You might remember Saul is the first king of Israel, but he has become, by 1 Samuel 17, he's become disobedient to God. And now the, the Philistines have made an incursion into Israel, and Saul seems unable to do anything about it. The Philistines were idolaters who lived along the Mediterranean Sea in the land of Israel today, the coastlines. They originally were from Egypt, but they moved up into uh, Palestine or up into Canaan along the sea and worshipped a fish god named Dagon. Had the head of a fish. They were fishermen. And so the Philistines have come into the land of Israel, into the middle of it, and have confronted, seeking to engage militarily the people of Israel. So you have Israel on one hillside, and you have the Philistines on the other hillside, and in between was a valley. 
As this stalemate continues, suddenly a huge man makes his appearance. A giant of a man. If you look back, it's the most descriptive passage of a human being in the Bible. 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. There came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits, uh, a cubit was about 18 to 20 inches, maybe a little more. And that means that Goliath was about nine or ten feet tall. That's two feet taller than the tallest pro basketball player. The tallest man in American history was a man named Robert Wadlow. Uh, do we have a picture of him? There's Robert. That's a big dude. <laughs> that is 1918. It's in, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records. And... Goliath is about a foot taller than he is. That sure gives you some idea. And then in verse 5, it says he had a helmet of bronze on his head and armed with a coat of mail. Now, evidently, he had gone to the post office. <laughs> no, every time I read that, I think of a guy who's, who's just dressed in these letters. <laughs> I know, that's ridiculous. But mail is a military term for armor that's scaled. And this layered armor, it says here, he had a helmet of bronze and armor with a coat of mail, and the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels. That's about 200 pounds. So his, this coat that was wrapped around him of armor weighed as much as an average man would. And then in verse 6, it says he had, a, he had bronze armor on his legs and then a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders and the shaft of his spear, <clears throat> verse 7, was like a weaver's beam, like a fence rail. And the spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. That was about 25 pounds. So here he emerges from the Philistine army and stands in the valley, Israel on one side, Philistines on the other, and bellows out his challenge. Let someone come and fight me, and if... They win, all the Philistines will be their servants. And if I win, then all the Israelites will be our servants. In other words, there will be a fight of representatives. But no one dared to go and fight him, obviously. And verse 11 of 1 Samuel 17 says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. It scared them to death. So the stalemate continues. Now at the same time, there is this young man crossing over the hills and the valleys to come to the military camp of Israel. His name is David. He's about... Oh, 16 or 17 years old. And as he comes, the reason he's there is because his father, Jesse, has sent him to take food and water to his older brothers. Uh, verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse who had eight sons. And it names the sons in verse 13. Three of the oldest ones of Jesse were at the battlefield. They had signed up to fight. 
Verse 14 says, And David was the youngest of all the sons. So out of eight sons, David is the youngest. One of my points that I want to make today is that you do not have to be an adult to be used mightily of God. There's an incredible history of teenagers that God has used to advance His kingdom, win souls, build the church, glorify God, and do feats of faith. And here comes David. Now, David happens to overhear Goliath as he boasts and as he praises the god Dagon, and it says that he would come up in 1 Samuel 17, verse 16, for 40 days he would come forward and take his stand and challenge morning and night. David happens to show up to bring food to his brothers during one of those uh, times. So he says, first to his brothers and then to Saul the king, he says, I'll go out and fight him. He goes to King Saul. Let's pick that up in verse 34. David said to Saul, verse 34, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. I've always pondered that verse because I would figure if I was a shepherd and a lion had a sheep in his mouth, I'm thinking, I'm going to let that go. <laughs> I mean, I can see myself defending the sheep, but once it's in the mouth, I think we can give up on that one. But David said, I delivered it out of his mouth, verse 35. I want young people to realize what they can do by the power of God. And I jotted down this illustration. I want y'all to think about this. In Matthew 17, Jesus and his disciples came to Capernaum. And the collectors, the tax collectors of the temple tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher pay the temple tax? It was a half a shekel. Every Jewish male over 20, and I get this from Exodus 30, verse 13 and 14, it's called the, temple, the, the, the shekel of the sanctuary because it supported the temple or the sanctuary. And every male, Exodus 30, verse 14, over 20 had to pay it no matter who you were, if you were an Israelite. <laughs> and here's the point on this passage. If Peter, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, so as not to offend them, go and catch a fish and in the fish's mouth, you'll find to a, a whole shekel. That's a half shekel was the amount. So he said, you pay for you and you pay for me. Now, why is that significant? What that means is Jesus and Peter were the only ones over 20. Exodus 30, verse 14 said that everybody over 20 had to pay it. Jesus said, 
you'll find a shekel. It's a half shekel for both one for each. Pay for you, pay for me. That means the disciples, 11 out of the 12, were under 20 years old. They were teenagers. Think about that. Those were the ones God called upon to change the world. So out of the whole Israelite army, who is the one who slays Goliath? The youngest of Jesse's sons. The one not even old enough to be in the army. And I want to challenge the teenagers and the young people to be giant killers. Don't wait till you grow up. <laughs> be mountain movers and soul winners and kingdom builders. Your best work may be now. So David goes forward. He, he picks up this is where we have our text. He, he goes in front of Goliath in verse 46 and he says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And he picks up a s stones on the way to meet Goliath from a brook. And you throw a slingshot much the way um, the... The motion is kind of like a woman's softball throw. You know how they wind up and underneath come at it like that? And boy, if you've seen a professional, you know those, those ladies can hurl that softball. And that's the way you throw a slingshot. Down like that and then release it. And a slingshot can throw a stone up to 80 miles an hour. And there was one vulnerable spot. He had on a coat of mail. He had on a bronze helmet. He, even his legs were covered. He had a shield. But there was one spot right there. <laughs> and that's where David aimed. And that's where the stone went, and that's how God killed him. God knows the vulnerable point. And I think he put a little extra force behind that stone. And that giant stood there, stunned for a moment, and then it says he fell forward on his face, and the whole ground shook around him. Four to five hundred pound guy just fell flat. Now, the things that we can learn from this, and this is for our young people and for the rest of us alike, because we all face giants. Yours may not be a big soldier, but maybe it's a doctor's diagnosis. Maybe that's your giant. Maybe it's a huge debt or a marriage problem. Maybe it's death itself. And these, these giants that just stay there and talk to us and challenge us, and they don't go away. They just keep coming back for 40 days and nights. Goliath challenged. 1 Samuel 17, 16, he took his stand morning and evening. What is it that's not going away? How do you face a Goliath? So here are some things from this story of David that I want to put before you as ways to face your challenges, your giants in life. Number one, be careful who you listen to. When David first arrives, he goes to his brothers because he has food for them. And this is 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. 
And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and his anger was kindled against David, and said, Why have you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and evil of your heart. You have come down to watch the battle. His older brother accused him of just coming for entertainment. He, in other words, he criticized his motives. <laughs> You're going to get criticized. And sometimes people just criticize your reason, your motive, your heart. There's no way to disprove that. That's why Jesus said, judge not. The root. And look what Saul said to him. This is in verse 33. When he finally went to Saul and said, I'll kill this giant. I, I've killed a lion and a bear. Saul said, verse 33, you are not able to go against this Philistines, for you are but a youth. Don't let people accuse you of having wrong motives or having a lack of ability. You're not old enough to serve God. You have to be careful and filter the words that people will bring against you. Boy, I want to say amen to my preaching right there because I can look back on my life and I can just all these words that have come to me over the years in the building of the church. We had a, when I first came here, I mean, I hadn't been here three months. We had a pastor's meeting and I attended it. And they said, so you're the new pastor over at New Haven. And the, and the church was run down. The church was falling in. The church had water in the auditorium. The roof was leaking. The parking lot was coming up, coming apart. The neighbors were complaining about how the appearance was. And one of the deacons said, why are you, why'd you come here? You must be in trouble. <laughs> you must be running from the law. <laughs> and uh, they said, you're kind of it for us. If, you know, if you can't get it started, we're done. And one, uh, one uh, guy came up to me. He said, I just want you to know I was here when you came. I'll be here when you're gone. <laughs> well, thank you for that. But we had this pastor's meeting, and, and I shared with some of the pastors. Now I was in my 30s, and I said, I just, I, I believe God can do a work here. We're right on a main thoroughfare. And one of the pastors said, Well, there's been 10 pastors in seven years at this church. And that's why it's in the mess it's in. And he said, I don't think even Paul could do anything here in Flint. I said, well, I'm not counting on Paul. I'm counting on Jesus. <laughs> and we did see God do a great work there. And on me, in many years, we led the association of Baptist churches in baptisms and were able to plant this church out of the overflow of people there. But I, that, and that's just in the first year I was there. And over the years, the negative comments that have come to me. So you have to filter. People will accuse your motives. They will accuse your abilities. And you just have to keep your eye on God. Here's the second thing. Focus on the greatness of God, not the greatness of the problem. The question is not, how big is Goliath? 
But the question is, how big is your God? That's the question. Max Lucado notes that David made one statement about Goliath. It's in verse 36. He says, Your servant has struck down lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he defied the armies of the living God. All he says about him is he's going to fall. But if you look at the statements David makes in this story about God, verse 36, he's called the living God as opposed to the idols, which are just dead monuments. In verse 37, he's, David calls God the one who delivered him. In verse 45, he calls him the Lord of hosts, which means the Lord of armies, the Lord of angels, and the God of armies. In verse 47, he calls him the Lord who saves. David's focus was on the greatness of God. David asked no questions about Goliath, his skills, his size, his age, his weaponry. But he had nine references to the greatness of his God. So focus on the greatness of God. When you have this issue, and it won't go away, Keep your focus on the greatness of God. Magnify Him in worship. Here's the third thing. First was be careful who you listen to. Filter words. Second, focus on the greatness of God. Third, run toward your problem, not away from it. 1 Samuel 17, 48. When the Philistine rose and came and drew near... David ran quickly toward the battle. I love that. Because when we got in, when we first built this building, a million and a half dollar loan, and the, and, and the recession then hit and left us at the bottom, then the bank would call. The temptation was to let the phone ring. But... God said, no, go toward the battle line. Pick up the phone. Talk to the person. Go toward Goliath. Don't run from the problem. And then number four, David went to battle with what he had. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 50, verse 50. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, struck the Philistine and killed him. And look at this. And there was no sword in the hand of David. David went without a sword. He didn't have one. So what do you have as a teenager? Say, I don't have much. Go with what you have. Go in your weakness. Go in your youth. Go in your inability. Your inability with God's mighty power is sufficient. I love Hebrews 11.34. Speaking of those who had faith, it says, They escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong in weakness... And, and I love this, this part. And they became mighty in war. And I thought about that. They didn't try to become mighty, then go to war. No, they went to war and became mighty in the war. Can I get an amen on that? See, that's what we have to do. We want to sit passively until we get mighty. No. Go in your weakness. Go, uh, don't wait in your passivity. And, and many of us do not consider ourselves as smart or beautiful or rich or cool 
I'm referring to, not to myself, of course, but, but to you all. You don't have a sword like others. You might even feel inferior. And who knows, maybe you are inferior. <laughs> you ever think about that? <laughs> Amen. David was inferior to Goliath when it came to military prowess. It is God who made up the difference. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter if you're inferior or superior. If you're superior, God can still defeat you. If you're inferior, God can still give you the victory. So they went, they were made strong in their weakness. They became mighty in the war. David became mighty when he went with what he had to go with. And they put foreign armies to flight. Did you notice he took his sword and cut off the Goliath's head? And, and then the Israelites all got bold and started chasing Philistines. And when the day was done, they had chased them out of the land of Israel. And the general of Israel's army, Abner, went and got David and brought him to Saul the king. And I love this, 1 Samuel 17, verse 57. As soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. <laughs> he had never let go all day long. He had never let the head of the Philistine out of his hand. Every time he would see a Philistine, he'd go, hey. <laughs> and the Philistine would go, ah. <laughs> yeah, baby. I like it. It's pretty impressive. He became mighty in war. So when you face your enemy, and I would also advise you that the devil is a Goliath. Be careful who you listen to. Focus on the greatness of God. Run toward your problem and go with what you have to go with. And God will bless you. Amen. Let's receive our offering. Let's worship in our giving. And let's begin to pray that God would use each of us for these coming days, especially November 4, on Youth Day, Student Day. We'll have a service that morning for youth and we'll have a service that evening for our high school and college and career. Let's be praying. All right, bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that you make us able to cope. I thank you that you give us victory in Jesus Christ and that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. Bless each one here today with victory over their enemies, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.